Hi everyone, it's Stephanie again with Bruce who just got done talking about how he was able to get diagnosed with um, prostate cancer um, and really the catalyst was your brother. And, and you know, so in a, in a way, I guess, really good to just sort of get that heads up earlier rather than, you know, later. Um, but at this point you've described to deciding, okay, I'm gonna go for the, the surgery. Um, so talk us through sort of what the prep was like for that, uh, what you think is really important or what was really important for you to know before going into surgery, and then we'll talk about the actual recovery after. So one of the best things is something that I didn't know at the time was going to impact the surgery too much. Um, but rewinding a little bit when my PSA was rising very rapidly, and as I looked at what are the things I'm in control of that I can do to, to, to mitigate and, and, and save my own life. Uh, one of those, after talking to uh, doctors at uh, 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 Johns Hopkins and looking at materials from Mayo Clinic and, uh, and NIH, was that uh, diet and exercise are things I can control. And so I, um, there's a study called the, um, the China study relating to um, a low incident of prostate cancer in, in China versus the U.S., and they tracked uh, immigrants to the U.S., and then they soon had the same rates of prostate cancer uh, as, the, uh, as the other people in the U.S. And so that takes the genetic part out of it. So that means there's definitely some environmental part. And the, the, at the time, it was mostly looked at as, as red meats as a, one of the diet things. So I basically uh, shifted to a, a complete vegetarian diet, and then I exercised like a madman. And, um, and I also dropped out of the work. I took time off of work um, because after that meeting with my doctor where they gave me the grim results, um, you know, I was talking to my staff and I said, uh, you know, I don't know, I just, I really don't feel like coming in. And then one of the, my, you know, one of my uh, senior people said, uh, well, then don't, we got, we got this, we'll take care of it. You just go and don't worry about it. So, um, so in a few weeks, I, um, Basically, researched the, the the options for me for treatment, and settled on the the on the um, surgery. But uh, but I exercised every day. I was riding uh, uh, about ten miles a day on the bike, and um, and it basically it flattened my PSA. It didn't rise anymore after that. And so uh, so in, in that short period of time, I can say at least it, it slowed things down. But as a consequence. I had also lost a, a fair amount of weight, mm. uh, probably about 10 pounds during that time. And so my surgery was very quick. The doctor came out and uh, said, you know, we, it's normally a lot harder to do because of so much fat internal. And by my reducing the amount of fat that I had made it a lot easier for the surgeons. Oh, wow. and, I, you know, and so I, get, I, you know, I just looked at him and said, hey, if you're coming into my house, it makes sense I should clean up for you, right? And uh, so, uh, so, so it's a benefit. Not only do you slow down the cancer, but you also make it easier for the surgery. So if there's one thing in prep I could say to is try and, you know, to the extent you can, uh, maintain a healthy lifestyle until the surgery, you know, afterwards, but, but right. really um, do the best you can to, to be in, in good shape when you go in. And I actually visited my office uh, the week before my surgery. And they were all stunned. They said, wow, you look great. I thought you were dying from cancer. <laughs> it's like, well, I do look great now, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, so that was the main thing, was uh, just trying to stay as healthy as I could before the, the surgery. The prep uh, itself for the surgery um, wasn't too bad. Um, they did do... I, um, uh, they did do some... Um, uh, scans, you know, where I had to do the, um, uh, the, the bone scan and, uh, and then, uh, you know, the, the CAT scans. And so those were, um, somewhat, uh, uh of a, oh, what I want to say, they're, um, you know, just arduous. You go through and, and for any one scan, it wasn't that bad, but I also did an MRI and that was probably the, the toughest one. 
And, and um, actually, since you're bringing it up, Bruce, I'd love to go into what each of those experiences was like, you know, um, kind of quickly, but right. if we haven't gone through them. Before we do, um, this is a picture uh, before your surgery, about a month before. Um, you just want to describe some of the folks here? Oh, yeah. So um, two of my kids on the, on the right there, uh, Davey and, and Taylor, and then my, my spouse, Lisa, in front of me, and then I have the, the No Fear hat on. Uh, right behind, and we're obviously in a crowd <laughs> down on the National Mall, uh, Washington, D.C. Gotcha. It, it, but I love your no fear uh, beanie. <laughs> it's <laughs> representative of, of your attitude going in. <laughs> it seemed to be fitting because uh, I was really, um, you know, I mentioned one of the uh, cancer support groups, and uh, the first one I went to, um, they said, uh, you know, he asked me as a newcomer if I had any thoughts on, on the cancer support group. And I said, you know, yeah, actually, I think the cancer support group is a terrible idea. It's <laughs> doing just fine on its own without any help. It's me that needs the support, not <laughs> cancer. And uh, they, not a chuckle, not a smile. They all just got, <laughs> so at that point, I thought, wow, there needs to be a lot more humor in, in, in this. And I, I'm going that later, too, about during some of my treatments uh, of uh, the importance of humor and of keeping a, a positive attitude. Right. And I think it never occurred to me that I would not succeed um, in terms of I felt that this is something I can win, that I have every intention of winning. Um, were we scared? Of course we're scared. Uh, but I felt like there was things I could do, you know, just, you know, whether it's the exercise and the diet and doing what the doctor says. Um, I, I was not about to let cancer ruin my life. Mm -hmm. um, without a fight and um, and oddly a lot of that fight is trying to be as normal as, 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 you, as you can mm -hmm. you know um, um, but uh, um, so in, in terms of the, the, the pre-op stuff um, they did a, a CAT scan to see if there's any if they could find it in any of the tissues they um, which is not really a, a high fidelity test but it uh, but it's something that because they you know if you can see it in the CAT scan things are probably pretty bad and then they do a bone scan, which is when they um, they do inject uh, uh, an isotope into your blood, and which um, felt kind of warm. It's kind of a weird feeling going through, but it, well, it didn't hurt or anything. But it just was kind of a, a strange sensation. Um, and then uh, uh, and then they do a, a, a an X-ray type. I think again, it's like a CAT scan type uh, 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 machine. But, um, and that, they're, then they're looking for any infection in the bones because then it's progressed uh, a lot further. And that's a whole nother stage of, of, of cancer that's um, um, likely fatal. Um, so those both came back clear. And then also did, uh, they did some um, imaging um, and where they put a probe in, into the rectum and did a, another kind of a CAT scan. And that gives them a lot more fidelity of what for, for the surgery to help guide them with where they what they need to do and then see if there's anything in the margins or in the tissue surrounding it. And, uh, and on that one, you know, that one I came out and uh, um, my wife, she kind of looked at me and, and uh, she said, I, I just came out of that and said, uh, I've been violated. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, uh, uh, that one I wasn't, I wasn't ready for. They said they'd put a probe up, but I didn't know anything about that probe. Uh, so fortunately they didn't tell me too much about it at times. So I probably shouldn't mention it here, but uh, but it was a very quick boom and probe in, but it wasn't comfortable. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, you're sitting there for for 20 minutes while they do it. Um, and so through the course of my whole treatment, they they did that twice. And so the second time, at least I knew what was coming. <laughs> you gotta relax and go. Okay, you know, this is it. But um, what is it called? What is this one's test called? It was an MRI. Um, but I don't remember the name of the, the probe they put in there. It's something that the NIH was doing as part of their uh, uh, research. Okay. And so, um, so, yeah, and again, how we talked about earlier, when, when the NIH is interested in the case, you get the brass ring, but not necessarily when you want to be <laughs> going. Can you say that again? I actually just missed it. You said with the NIH? Um, so when, when, when people want to study you for your cancer, that's, uh, you know, that means you've hit a brass ring you really didn't want to reach for. <laughs> so, uh, but, um, yeah, so that was a, a kind of a new treatment thing they were using to, to see if that increased their ability to, to find the cancer at the margins or invasive into the outside tissues. 
Interesting. So were you officially part of, you were officially part of a study at NIH? Correct, yes. Do you so, remember uh, the, the name of the study or any sort that, of? Uh, no, I did, I did that and I participated also in a, um, uh, a, a fatigue study, which I can tell you about more. That's a toward the later. Uh, yeah, and yeah, you sent a photo of it. I'd love for you to describe yeah. what that is. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll get those details maybe a little bit later. But yeah, you, you did everything at the NIH then. Right, right. Um, let's see here. Okay, and so the MRI, well, I know sometimes people don't want to know too much or too little, but for you, it sounds like knowing at least having gone through it the first time, the second time was slightly easier just because you knew what to expect? Yeah, it didn't make it any less uncomfortable per se, but at least it wasn't the shock. <laughs> you know? It's like, okay, I can kind of mentally prepare for it. Where before, you know, I would have no clue. And uh, I lay down, the guys that roll over, then, you know, he shoves it in and you're just, you know, <laughs> stunned. Like, right. wow, what just happened? Okay. So, uh, yeah, that was not a, that was not a um, fun, uh, fun <laughs> experience. Yeah. The bio uh, was more pleasant than that in a sense. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh. Okay. So at least people can know, just beware, there may be a very shocking sort of. Yeah. And I don't know if that has become mainstream or if anybody else does it in the NIH. Um, okay. But the fidelity that they got out of it, um, I think, was um, when they showed me some of the pictures, it was quite remarkable. So I think um, even though it was a, a bit uncomfortable, uh, really uncomfortable, it was, uh, it was valuable. Okay. And, and so uh, then they did, right before surgery, also they do uh, a complete physical, all the chemistry, all the blood tests. Um, they checked my heart as well. Um, I did that to my regular doctor. Um, most of these tests were done by my regular doctor uh, in preparation, even though the surgery was done at NIH. And then, um, uh, then when I went into surgery, um, it was a uh, kind of calming. I mean, it's like you realize now something's going to get done finally. Um, I wasn't. I didn't really worry about things that some people it causes other people maybe anxiety that. You know, will I wake up, et cetera, et cetera. I wasn't, I wasn't too concerned about that. Um, that said, you know, we did the will thing. We did the will in, in your order. I, you know, I um, uh, made sure all of our finances were in order and made sure my oldest son, who wasn't in the picture, um, get, you know, knew how to access things if, if um, my wife wasn't able to. And so, uh, you know, just some just common sense things like that that you do before any surgery. Um, and then, uh, but it was quick in and out. You know, I went in the, the trying to remember if I, I guess I stayed overnight. I'm thinking it was an early surgery or no. I don't remember if I stayed overnight or not the, the, the first night. But I do know there's a snowstorm. Yeah, we did arrive the evening before. That's right. We arrived the evening before because my sister was late. She came out to the top of the morning. And uh, there's a snowstorm. So they got there late in the morning. And, um, they wheeled me in and they told my wife it'd be about three hours. And so um, when I came out of surgery, uh, they were, I was only in there for about a half an hour. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so my wife wasn't around. Nobody is around. Cause they, they, they're expecting a, a bit of a wait. And so, uh, so I woke up and, um, but to that, be that, honest, uh, that wasn't the first thing on my mind. It was like, okay, I'm here. And uh, I'm, I'm, at the moment, I'm kind of comfortable, even though you got IVs and stuff stuck in there. And, um, and so I really, you know, I wasn't, um, I wasn't alarmed that, they, that my wife wasn't there when I woke up or right by my side. You know, just, that was quick, 30 minutes. I mean, I yeah. think that was a result of, of you having lost a lot of that fat, right? And they, right. they, said, they, they said it was very clean in there. They could get right to it. They didn't have to move things out of the way so much. And, uh, um, and then when, you know, and to be honest, I mean, this, I'm an engineer and a geek and, uh, there was a, a geeky aspect of this. And when I found out that the surgery is going to be robotic, I was just like, oh, you know, I'd do that even if I didn't have cancer, just, oh, cool. you know? And so, uh, I was really into getting the robotic surgery just because it was cool. <laughs> so, uh, so while geeking, I out, geeking out over the surgery, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um and, and and so when you woke up, it was so quick. When you woke up, were you in pain? Um, and then eventually, with uh, recovery, did you have to stay overnight? And, and what was that yeah, like? Yeah, we, we stayed a, a couple of days. Um, and then maybe even one extra day. Um, 
just because of um, yeah, um, just at the at home there's a lot of stairs and other things that they just uh, and, and animals. The, the dog, we have a dog and she's very rambunctious at times and it's like with a catheter, I really didn't want the dog jumping on me too much. <laughs> so, right, right. And uh, they wanted to make sure you were able to walk around. Um, right. and they're, very, they're, they're very proactive in getting you walking literally the first day almost. It's, um, I think it was the very first evening that I did my first sort of getting out of bed and at least going a few feet. Right. Um, the one challenge I had, um, overall I was very relatively comfortable um, they, you know, of course they're giving you a lot of medication but um, my catheter at one point got uh, a little blocked mm -hmm. and so again I think that's part of why I may stay an extra day but that was very uncomfortable so that finally that blocking was released and then wow then I was like in heaven after that I was like oh, okay <laughs> I, I filled up a lot of the bag you know and so that was my only really um, uh, tough part coming out that isn't isn't necessarily normal for everybody but that was something that happened to me um the first night they gave me uh, uh, some ambient and i'd never in my life taken a sleeping pill i've always been sort of an insomnia and and, and, and burn the candle at both ends all the time I, I traditionally in my life i've just lived on four or five six hours of sleep a night and uh that pill was wonderful <laughs> so they, they gave that to me and i went out like a light and uh, cause I had some anxiety about falling asleep with all this stuff in my arms. And they said, don't worry, we'll give you something. And mm -hmm. so uh, the next the next morning, like, or when they, whenever they woke me up to, to, to uh, change something, I was uh, like, that was just, that was wonderful. So, uh, <laughs> so, you got uh, the best sleep of your life out of surgery. That's yeah, yeah, <laughs> great. Right. Um, um, the walking, I mean, for me, that's the first time also with a cat. Yeah. And so that was probably the most, uh, I had a lot of anxiety about that. And, and in hindsight, you know, once, you know, it's not, again, it's, you can't wait to get it out, but it's not really painful or not anything that's, you know, I was worried about every little movement I did, but it wasn't that, uh, uh, in the end of the day, it was quite livable. Um, but yeah. that was, and, and even more than that, my, my biggest fear was removing it. Right. And I just couldn't think any way in my head how they could remove that thing and it not hurt like crazy. You know, uh, uh, you know, it just, yeah, I know I'm being a wimp. I mean, women give birth to, to kids all the time. And I, I, you know, I told my wife at, at her, her bedside labor that, uh, you know, if there's some way I could take all the pain off of her instead of her going through this, that uh, we would be childless. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, so I was worried about that. But again, fear is unfounded. Yeah, when um, after a week they take it out, um, they put in some cold fluid, boom, it's gone, and you don't even hardly realize it. It's just uh, mm -hmm. it's like a flash, and, and it's out, and uh, no pain. That's so, uh, so it was. So that's my biggest anxiety: is removing of the catheter, which again is unfounded. But it was, um, it was uh, challenging the, the the cleaning of it and uh, the cleaning of of uh, the area, and so there's a lot of maintenance to do with it. And um, you were doing at home, right? Right, right, doing that at home. And um, so that was, you know, just arduous. Um, okay. uh, yeah, those are the, the main bits. But, you know, you say unfounded fear, but look, I think it's a common one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's uncomfortable to think about a tube like that, and uh, you're bound to think there's going to be pain. So I think it's, uh, but it's reassuring to know, of course, nurses and medical staff are dealing with this all the time and they know what to do yeah. usually. So, um. yeah, terrific. And uh, I have to say that at NIH, um, and yeah, you know, I haven't really done any surgeries in my life. So I can't be honest in a comparison, but the, the staff at NIH um, really cared and really uh, took care of you. They okay. were uh, passionate about the, the, the care of their patients. That's and, wonderful. Um, and I appreciated that a lot. It matters, you know, through through things like this. Um, and so I'm so glad to hear you had that experience. Uh, as we sort of wrap up the surgery, any last thing about the recovery portion? I mean, it sounds like it was it was really the catheter and then the walking and making sure you could urinate and, and all that. Um, but outside of that, it seemed. It was um, the, uh, it was all the, the, the patient to walk further and further every day. Um, and, and it is, it is tough feeling, you know, 
uh, weaker or uh, what's the word I'm looking for vulnerable that you 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 know you're just taking little baby steps at first and and going very slow right. and so we we started off um, you know just slowly working my way down the sidewalk you know one day I'd go a few feet and then the next day maybe a few feet further mm -hmm. and so that became our goalpost every day I was trying to be can I make it to that next driveway sort of thing and uh, right. so it's just um, yeah baby steps. Yeah, patience. Yeah. Patience. Yeah, I, I really love that you're highlighting this because that's a lot harder than than I think a lot of us realize is the patience of your mind wants to go faster, your body can only go as fast as it can. So and it probably went by quicker than I remember. You mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, you're you really are up and around pretty quickly after it. Um, you know, once the catheter comes out, you're kind of free to do after that. But you do, you do, you do. You need support, like um, physical help, immediately after the surgery. Um, the initial walks, uh, a little bit um, more of, again, wanting it as opposed to needing it. <laughs> There's a, you know, wanting someone right there, you know, with your arm in case you you, you don't make it. <laughs> so, right. Right. Um, but I think, uh, but as you test the waters, you realize you, know, you can you can go pretty well now. My brother, who had much uh, more invasive surgery, um, took a lot longer to recover from that. Mm. Uh, but with the robotic surgery, and, uh, and I didn't have near the, the, the invasiveness that he had of the, of the cancer, that um, I recovered much quicker. You know, I was, I was sitting up uh, within, a, within a few days and uh, moving around the house. And so right. Right. it was a uh, much, much quicker recovery. That's good news and actually i hadn't even <laughs> established this earlier you were staged at 4a um and and then so which means there was you know it, there was metastasis and so I, I my question to you is can you describe sort of the before and after picture of surgery um you don't have to go into all the details i know you sent me the results of the okay. actual surgery but okay. in terms layman's terms and sort of to boil it down what did it what what did it look like oh. So they did a, you know, they, of course they did a pathology report after on the actual cancer um, once they got the whole thing out to, to look at it. And my my pre-op pathology or from the biopsy showed a, it was a, a six seven, and my pathology report at, at the time of the surgery came out as an eight nine, which was uh, a lot scarier. Um, but the, the the real signal that was was they also said they had invaded the uh, lymph node. And so, as a precaution, they just removed all the lymph nodes down there. I don't think there's like 20 lymph nodes. And so, but that, at that point, once I knew that it invaded a lymph node, um, that took away my comfort of knowing that it's gone forever. Because I knew mentally that um, now it's gone outside the prostate, and so who knows where it can go. So at that point, I'd already, once I heard that, my elation over the the surgery um, was tempered, you know. And, and I remember what a friend is saying, "So now you're done, you know, you're you're cancer free." And I said, "Well, maybe, maybe not." Right. And they thought, "Well, that's really a negative attitude." And I thought, no, I'm just trying to be practical. Is it, you know, it did invade a lymph node, so I know I'm not necessarily out of the woods. And that proved to be correct. In that um, they did a PSA test um, a, a few weeks after the surgery. And it was minuscule, but it was still there. It was about 0.17, if I recall. Yep. But it was, um, and the doctors explained that that's not abnormal, that sometimes there's some residual PSA after a surgery. So they waited about another six weeks or so, I, I think. Um, and then it had risen to 0 0.21 or over 0.2. Yep. And which, at that point, they said it's an indication that it's still there somewhere. Uh. Um, that the surgery uh, wasn't a complete success. Right. Um, but the the biggest success though is it bought me a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. yes. uh, had had I not discovered my error and taken the wrong um, cancer test uh, from my brother, you know, I wouldn't have survived. It was you know it was very aggressive. The whole the whole prostate was engulfed. It gone to the lymph node, so, and so um, and with an eight nine, my my odds of survival were not good. Um. Had uh, had I not had the surgery right away. And, and even then, um, the, the word the doctor used is this is a very lethal cancer. And um, that word kind of, you know, kind of resonates a little bit in my head. But, um, uh, but by this time, you know, I had done a lot of homework. My 
family had done the homework, and so we kind of knew what the next steps would be, which would be the salvage radiation going right. forward. And right. so, um, so I was mentally prepared for that. I mean, it's at least just even hearing the numbers that low means you got you got some time. Um, right, right. I mean, how sobering, you know, right. just, just another, another, another episode of, of sort of sobering news. Um, and, and to be clear, the staging then, because the lymph node was found only after the surgery, that was when the 4A came out. Is that right? Right, right. And you don't hear the, the 4A in that much, too much. Um, I mean, it's what the, the pathologists use, what the doctors use a lot, but in, in, in like the cancer groups, really are focused on your Gleason and your... Gleason and your PSA scores. Okay. That, that's what's, you know, most talked about. Um, so you have to kind of look back and kind of read the, the details of, of what those other numbers actually mean. Right. So, so your final Gleason score then, because of the surgery, <clears throat> sort of at the worst point was eight, nine, or? Correct, yeah. Eight, nine in one side, and nine, eight in the other. Eight, nine in one side, and I think it was seven, eight in the other. Got it, okay. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, so, so then you knew at that point, okay, it's that next step. You knew it was salvage radiation. Um, can you describe what that process is like the pr beforehand and the actual radiation? Right. So, um, uh, beforehand they gave me, and again, we're talking NIH, so it's, um, it was, they're doing things that maybe not, they weren't doing at the time in other places. Um, but they start off with um, some uh, uh, medication, a Casadex and uh, a Lupron before the radiation. And those were started uh, about six to eight weeks ahead of time. And that was the idea was to sort of get my testosterone production down before the radiation. And they had theory that that would help with the outcomes of the radiation. Um, and the radiation, the salvage radiation, even though you don't necessarily know exactly where it is, you know, they're, they're gaming on it that it's going to be down in the pelvic region still. And so, uh, so that's an unknown when you first start out, you know, with the radiation. Is it, 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 is it even there? Which is, where is a chance that it's not. It's somewhere else. But odds are, if you're, if you're a betting person, which, you know, you have no choice at that point but to gamble, then it's going to be in the pelvic. And so I took these um, uh, Casadex and Lupron. The Casadex, as I understand it, was to reduce the ability of your, your um, adrenal glands of being receptors of testosterone. And then the, the Lupron was an injection to help um, reduce the production of testosterone. So they're kind of shooting at it from both angles of uh, where, where it's used as well as where it's produced. And because um, so, testosterone is basically what the, the prostate cancer feeds on. And ca prostate cancer is really um, kind of a diabolical creature in that even if that, without the testosterone, um, it can take some uh, 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 estrogen, I think it was, or, um, but anyways, it, can, it can start producing its own testosterone. So uh, if it can't find enough to feed, so it can mutate into that, that kind of a manner, which is kind of scary. And, uh, but uh, fiendish, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. <laughs> so, but they, um, and so the, the but the process ahead of time before the, the radiation was to drive down my testosterone levels and to starve out any little bit of cancer that was there because again it's min minuscule at this point very small PSA right. numbers right. and um, then they started the daily radiation of the um, I want to say about the, that's the I'm trying to remember how many months I took it um, it says six weeks is that six right? weeks yeah Six, um, yep. six weeks daily uh, radiation except for the weekends. And NIH um, did a, a process of having you drink water before the radiation and to help move your organs out of position, to, out of the way of the radiation uh, beam, as well as to uh, um, make it a more uh, clean shot. And so the theory being that the radiation have a lot more effectiveness and then less collateral damage to other tissue. And so that, you know, it seems to have worked, but that was, that was uh, hard to do, uh, I have to say, because you're drinking water and the idea is to fill up your bladder quickly. Mm. And then you hold it <laughs> uh, right. during the treatment. And so you're hoping to get it right the first time. You don't, it's hard to hold that, uh, hold that bladder. That's right. <laughs> um, and so, um, 
So that was a, a little uncomfortable. And talking to my uh, uncle, who has since passed away from the prostate cancer, he, um, they didn't do that uh, kind of care with the water when he took his treatment. And it was not that much different time in life than when I took it. So it, I, I believe that that was something that NIH is doing more than the, the outside labs are doing or the outside doctors. And um, seem to have the, the right benefits there. Um, right. The intended effects and how long were, was each radiation session? Um, the session itself was very short. I mean, it's 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, but that prep work of drinking the water, waiting till your bladder's full, and then going in there, and then they do a, a, a preliminary shot just to make sure everything's organized or that you know everything's how they want it, and then they do the actual radiation treatment. So, so they do a quick scan, it takes a, a minute or two. And then they look at the results and then adjust you maybe, and then they'll do the actual radiation treatment. So it's relatively quick. So the actual radiation itself might be quick, but the, from start to finish in terms of the prep with the drinking of the water yeah. and the smoothing. Uh, and a good hour and a half there. And hour and a half. Okay, good to yeah. know. And it was every day, Monday through Friday for six weeks. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, did you start to feel burns or any side effects? No, never felt the thing. Great. Good. I had to pee a lot. <laughs> but, yes, right. but other than that, didn't feel a thing. And uh, so it was, um, yeah, just holding, trying to hold still with a full bladder, that was the most challenging part. Right. Um, I know you had already described a little bit of the Casodex, but any other thing you want to talk about with, with that? Um, um, no, I think. Uh, yeah, the, the, just taking that ahead of time. That was, uh, I believe now that that's sort of the the gold standard now. I think everyone does this sort of pre-treatment uh, ahead of time uh, as a routine. Um, I couldn't swear to that, but I'm pretty sure that's what I read um, a little while ago. Okay, and, and then the Lupron, um, which is used in. I mean, I had Lupron too for my system. To, you know, before I went through chemo, I know it's used differently, but functions the same way, and so. Describe the that first Lupron shot, and then I know you had to take it for three years. So right. you could just sort of describe, um, you know, getting the shot, and were there side effects, and you know, those kinds of things. Yeah, the Lupron was probably the most impactful uh, thing on my life. Um, but it takes away all your testosterone, and so it's um, you know a lot of changes to your to your body. Uh, you know, I. Um, um, one of the things that the, I had a problem with was hot flashes, which are typically uh, uh, women's menopause type things. And so, um, of course, as the doctor's describing, you know, some of these side effects, my wife said, oh, see, you're getting ready to, you can, you can go through menopause with me. Uh, it's, um, but I was literally dripping, like I went to a meeting, because you're still at work, you know, and, right. uh, I go to work and and I'd have just just dripping on the paper in front of me, and I was like, yeah, I can't can't do this in a conference, and and so um, uh, you know, I talked to NIH, and I said, you know, is there you know is there something we can do about these hot flashes? They're just miserable, and they said, well, we can recommend you go get the uh, um, they first recommend is you know they can look at some more drugs and uh, medicine. And I said, no, I don't want any more uh, hormone things. I'm you know, so what else you got? And they said, well, they've heard that the, um, that the um, um, acupuncture mm. uh, might, might be effective. Right. And I've never really given a whole lot of stuff, but I was never a big believer necessarily in acupuncture. I didn't necessarily not believe it, but just the, so I kind of cracked my, you know, really? And they said, well, let's give it a shot. So I'm like, okay. So I went and uh, did acupuncture and it was remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's within within the first you know I was doing it once a week and within the first uh, four weeks it was, most of my side effects had gone away in terms of the, the hot flashes um, um, and after I did a I guess it was a six week treatment I think I did six or eight shots I don't remember which but um, I did a one more treatment about a year later and that pretty much solved all my hot flash problems throughout my Lupron treatment. Wow. Um, I get mild warmth and, you know, a little bit here and there, but nothing severe. And it was like a miracle. <laughs> it's just, I was, 
uh, I became a believer after that because I really sitting there as, he, as he's sticking me with these needles. I thought, you know, this ain't gonna work. <laughs> so, right, so, right. Because uh, it just seems so out of whack for a lot of people, and right. uh, you know, and it's become more acupuncture part of the integrative therapies, and you know, places are 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 starting to use it as like a you know treatment for side effects. And so I'm so happy that it worked for you. Um, you said how many how many times did you get acupuncture done? I think it's eight times total, once a week. Okay. And, uh, and it was, you know, by the end I kind of really wanted to be done with it. You know, just, it, but it was, you know, it wasn't really painful. It wasn't, um, again, it just having to. I'm not one that sits still very well, and having <laughs> to sit still for you know an hour or so, or a half an hour, I guess. Um, but um but it was fantastic because it, it was again i went in being a very much a skeptic and after the fourth week you know I, I was doing daily radiation i was part of this fatigue study and so i was just kind of used to just going where they told me and so it's just one more appointment and so i didn't wasn't really thinking about it and then he asked me so how's your hot hot flashes and that took me wow you know and i realized i haven't had any and so just halfway through the treatment, it had reduced it considerably. And wow. the other side effects of it, of course, um, you feel more emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, you're more tired. Uh, they're um, you're not. I, I didn't have nearly the assertiveness at work that I would normally have, uh, which um, in some cases it was, it was tough on the job a little bit because. I just didn't have any of the, or the long days I was nor normally used to working. And so, uh, and, and that time period of, uh, you know, through the, um, that three years of, uh, you know, 2013, 14, 15 kind of thing, 16, it was, that was really tough. Um, and I did exercise as much as I could. Now, in terms of the more physical, uh, physical things, it, um, it also reduces your bone mass. And so while you don't feel that, you're, it is a concern. So you're taking a lot of calcium during this time. Mm. And again, load-bearing exercises and walking and lifting and weights and, right. and doing what you can to try to mitigate that loss of, of, of bone mass. Right. And so, so I'm taking DEXA scans, which I never heard of until this, but, it, but women are familiar with it because they go and measure your bone density with a, with a, with a scan. And so it's kind of alarming the first time I went into the hut to get my DEXA scan, you know, I walk in, it's full of women, and they all kind of like shriek that the man was coming in. <laughs> it's the, like, sorry, ladies, I'm one of you now. <laughs> it's the, I'm join, join in the party. Yeah, no, that's uh, really interesting, just all the different sort of the range of, of side effects after that. I mean, how many, how many Lupron shots did you have to take overall? It, it varies. Um, I start off with quarterly shots because you can get different dose amounts. Right. And, um, and so I started with the quarterly and then I went to every six month shots. Um, so it was a bigger dose, but, um, and, and, but it was, you know, you didn't have to go get it as often. And so it's a shot in the, in the backside. Um, it, the shot wasn't that bad, uh, but but from all, what my wife says, the needle was really big. <laughs> so, so she says she's glad I didn't see it. She, said, yeah. oh, she, she told the nurse, don't show them the needle. <laughs> so, uh, so the needle might be big, but um, again, it, was no, it, it wasn't any worse than any other shot you've gotten in the, in the hind end. Right. Um, and then, uh, and then the, there was one night when um, you kind of learn more about, you can appreciate what, what women go through. That um, One night we were in bed and I was just kind of emotional and sad and my wife said well, what's wrong uh, i don't know yeah i'm just feeling this sad i don't know why right. and she went all right just a minute she reached into her bedside table and pulled out a piece of chocolate and said here eat this so i ate that and wow i feel better <laughs> so, so men when women say they want some chocolate don't <laughs> deny it to them they deserve it and it will help them. <laughs> it's real. It's real. <laughs> it's real. It is real. <laughs> um, that's, yeah, that's incredibly interesting. And, um, and by the way, it went from quarterly to, uh, sorry if I missed it, by the that's end. Um, yeah, and that was mostly out of convenience um, due to my duty stations and, uh, in the foreign service. And, uh, and so it just made it easier to do it every, every six months as opposed to every 90 days. Got it. Um, Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. So um, my, I guess, and then PSA undetectable ever since. I know you, you said you yeah. did have a scare in April of 2018 when you found blood in the urine, but that turned out to be something completely different. Yeah, that was um, not due to the cancer, but it was just a consequence of the, the radiation treatment. And so uh, that it, it does, you know, that there is some scarring in your bladder from the radiation, but you don't, you know, you don't feel it. It's painless. You don't, you don't notice it. Um, but I did have a, a small mass start to bleed in there. And uh, so they just uh, cauterized it. They went in and uh, um, it's just a, you know, a local, it does very quickly. And they went in and, uh, um, and just, you know, cauterized it so it didn't bleed anymore. And, you know, that was pretty quick. Um, they did a biopsy just to make sure. Right. And that came out negative. Um, Good. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I have to say it was disconcerting because when the doctor was, you know, you're awake while they're looking in your bladder with a little scope. And uh, and he's and he's talking about you know what we're looking at. Oh, there's you know this is some of the radiation that's spreading. And then I went hmm. And I looked at the monitor and went hmm. <laughs> I don't like hearing hmm. <laughs> I said, what do you mean hmm? The doctor said, well, it's hmm. <laughs> so, then. <laughs> said, well, it's a small mass, but um, you know we'll but that's where the bleeding's coming from, and uh, we'll cauterize and do a biopsy. But you were able they, to cauterize it right then. Yeah, yeah, and so he just says, "I think it's from the the radiation damage, but we'll make sure." And he turned out to be right; it was just <sighs> radiation damage. But um, that was a bit nervous. Yeah. Of course. Um, and, and my last question here is the follow up. What what has that was 2018 when you had the scare? But so what has been the follow up since? And is it with your urologist? Yeah, so I go in the uh, uh, see your urologist. I, NIH keeps tabs on me. They do a questionnaire and they, uh, and they talk to me and you know, ask me how it's going because they want to do their follow up on their studies. Um, I still take calcium. Um, and at this point, uh, I still do DEXA scans every couple of years, I guess. To, um, just a, and, and I've been relatively diligent about the, you know, doing load bearing exercises and I'm walking a lot. Um, you know, in this pandemic situation, we're not as much uh, uh, walking around an office building. I, you know, walk around the house and walk outside some. But, um, but as a consequence, I've been able to restore uh, uh, a good percentage of my the mass, that I, the bone mass that I lost. Good. So uh, I wasn't sure if it was re reversible or not. Right. The other consequence is um, I still don't eat red meat. Um, I still eat chicken and, uh, and poultry and, and fish. But uh, I still stay away from the red meat, and I'm grateful for you know Beyond Beef and those kind of products now <laughs> that allow us to have something. Um, and then, uh, and I think that's um, yeah. There's always the concern that it could come back. Um, you know, you're never fully out of the woods, but it doesn't rule your life. You know, uh, for a, for a, for a short period of time, it kind of did in the sense that. Uh, two reasons. One, um, I, I quickly became a, a vocal advocate, at least at work and around my friends and other people we knew that had kind of not decided not to pay, get a PSA test or put it off. And so I, I tell my story because I was shocked to learn about it too late. <laughs> so, uh, so that was really, I felt, uh, I feel very uh, strongly about that we should be, you know, talking about this more is something that men don't really like to talk about, right. at least in public. What I found is like when I spoke at, at my office um, after my surgery and before the radiation, um, I described some of my, my journey. Um, and if there's any questions, no questions. But I had a, 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 a lot of men come into my office during the following week privately to ask mm -hmm. me the questions. Right. They didn't want to ask anything right there in the group of, in front of everybody. Right. But they were very curious, and that's the way I've pretty much found it to be. Um, when I've been around colleagues or, or other places, and we talk about it, right? They want to hear, they want to talk about it, but one on one, they don't want to talk about it in a group. Privately, and, and actually, that this is a great segue into the the next section. But um, that's why we're so, um, you know, just I don't even know what the right word is, but grateful mm -hmm. and really happy that you're sharing your story because we know men are looking for these voices we know um but it, it's you know it's harder i think to find the people who are willing to express but you are driven by this passion to help other people and i that's why i feel um so blessed that we were able to meet so 
hang tight. Um, this, this next video is about uh, reflections and uh, a lot of the topics that are important to Bruce. Okay.